Over the past few days, we've been putting these Apple Silicon M1 Macs through their paces. I've been playing with the 16 gigabyte Mac Mini, and I've been really impressed so far with its performance. And I've been having a go with this entry-level MacBook Air. It has eight gigs of RAM, one GPU core less than the Mini, and of course, no fans. I'm also impressed with the performance and the amazing battery life of this little notebook. And we've published a couple of videos with our initial thoughts, but now it's time to run some direct comparisons between these machines. Answer some of the comments that you've left and uh, talk about our experience so far. And it, I think it's fair to say that there is a difference between these machines. Uh, but first, a word from our sponsor. Our thanks to Wondershare PDF Element for sponsoring this video. Let me quickly show you this fantastic piece of software on the iPad. PDF Element provides tools for commenting, highlighting, and annotating your document. You can even edit the text within the PDF, fill and sign PDF forms, and even create your own signature. PDF Element connects to your favorite cloud storage service for easy access to your files. And once you've opened a file, you can use the neat page view to extract individual pages or even rotate a page. PDF Element on the iPad supports Apple Pencil and Dark Mode. And there are versions of PDF Element for macOS and Android too. The new PDF Element 8 for Windows features a new simple to learn user interface and up to 300% faster performance over version 7. There's a new 100 gigabyte cloud option to allow you to edit PDFs anywhere on any device. Check out the links in the description for a free download, tutorials, and a very special offer. That is a really cool piece of software. I'm, I'm really impressed with that. Yeah, it is, it's really good. Uh, so, Pete, I wanted to talk about um, all of the videos that have been going on, on on YouTube. So lots of people have been testing these computers out, lots of YouTube reviewers waxing lyrical about the 8 gigabyte MacBook Air and saying how, you know, it's all the machine that you need, what's the point in having the, the Pro models. Um, lots of people talking about video editing. Yes. So. Uh, we did some video editing. So yesterday, uh, in fact, yesterday's video we edited here in the studio, and you edited it on this MacBook Air. How was that experience for you? Well, it was a bit of a mixed bag, if I'm honest. Uh, it started really, really well. So really smooth, dropping stuff into Final Cut Pro, 4K, 25 FPS footage. Um, Which codec is it? Uh, it was H.264 off the Panasonic camera we're recording on now. Okay, so 8-bit footage as well? 8-bit yes. eight, eight colour, that eight, is. 8-bit eight colour. Mm. And um, yeah, it, it, it was working really, really well. Um, and then as the edit started to get more... I'm going to use the word complex, but it wasn't really complex. It's when I started you know, adding in some B-roll, uh, some very simple titles, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Things started to get a bit laggy. Um, I had uh, points where the timeline, if you were playing on the timeline to review a bit of footage, it, you'd lose the ability to pause for a while. You had some beach balls as well, didn't you? I did have a few beach balls as well. So it started getting janky, shall I say. It wasn't a smooth experience anymore. Uh, lots of people are saying that the 8 gigabyte uh, M1 is using the internal SSD for swap file for memory. Yeah. And I wonder whether this is what we're seeing here, that as you were progressing with your edit in Final Cut, that it started to make use of the, the swap file. And whilst the internal SSD is very, very fast, obviously that is going to have an impact. Now, I think it's fair to say you weren't editing from the internal SSD, so there was no conflict between running the files off of the SSD and the potential swap file. Uh, you were using a Samsung T5 which is definitely quick enough for this footage. It is, I use it all the time on my MacBook Pro uh, 16 inch and never have any issues. I did look in Activity Monitor to see what the memory usage was and Final Cut Pro, uh, when it was starting to get laggy, was using somewhere between 3.3 to four gigs of the memory um, with not a lot else open to be fair. But again, we don't really understand how the, the Apple Silicon utilizes RAM. Well, bear in mind that it's unified, so it will be shared with the GPU, and obviously the GPU's got to do a bunch of work as well. Interesting. Yeah, of course. So a lot of people are wondering about the thermal performance of this. So, you know, we didn't notice it was getting really hot, did we? No. Um, in fact, anecdotally, the performance issues started to happen um, as, as I plugged it in. 
So when you were charging the battery? Yeah. So obviously I've been very interested in how long the battery lasts on the MacBook Air. I charged it when I first got it before I did the initial uh, benchmark tests and then I let it run. Uh, and normally I would have plugged it in long before this, but I let it run down to 10%. Uh, obviously Final Cut Pro is going to be using the, the higher powered CPU cores, so that's going to take a drain on the battery. So it got down to about 10% and then plugged it in. That was roughly the time I started making, um, adding the B-roll and the, the more complex parts to the edit. So it is entirely possible that the, the lagginess was down to thermal throttling, uh, restricting the performance and or the, the issues we've talked around, uh, the, the memory usage. Yeah, I, I've seen it said that it, uh, it tries to keep the temperature of the CPUs to 60 degrees at max, you know, which makes sense. Obviously, there's no fan for it to, to cool down, so you wouldn't want it getting any hotter than that. No, you wouldn't. I did put my hand underneath it a few times, and it, it wasn't particularly hot. Uh, not as hot as my MacBook Pro gets, and that, that's obviously got fans in it. Now, I, on the other hand, was editing at the same time on the Mac Mini, and I was editing the, the sponsor slot for today's video, uh, which, again, is a relatively simple edit. I mean, there's quite a few layers. There was a grade on it. There was a, an effect running. Uh, I have to say it was very smooth, but I wasn't using Final Cut Pro. I was using DaVinci Resolve 16. The, um, that's the free version. Uh, and it's also not optimized for Apple Silicon yet, but I have to say it was really nice, buttery smooth. I didn't have any of the issues that you had, and it was quick to complete the edit. Yeah, and in actual fact, we did fit, do the finishing of my MacBook Air video in DaVinci on your machine, uh, so the grading, the audio, that kind of thing, and, and that was smooth as well, wasn't it? It was, yeah. So I... I was really impressed with the performance of the Mac Mini. We're a little bit underwhelmed with the MacBook Air. Both of us experienced the two port limitation. Um, I, I, because I had my uh, USB-C monitor plugged into the to Mac Mini, which left me only one port free, I edit on an external SSD. So when I wanted to ingest media, I've got to unplug and replug, or you've got to embrace the dongle life. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and I was in a similar situation. Obviously, had to plug power in halfway through. I am editing off the Samsung T5, so uh, if I had to edit media, fortunately, I ingest media. Sorry, fortunately, I'd already ingested everything I needed, but it, it was apparent that I was going to have to end up with some dongles, which again just ruins the aesthetic of everything, and it's more kit to lug around with you. Mm. Not, Not a new thing for the MacBook Air, of course, to uh, be embracing dongles. Okay, so you'll notice that we've got uh, Cinebench running on the screen here, and uh, we actually set this up to do a 30-minute test. Now, I don't think this actually makes any difference to thermal throttling as compared to the 10-minute test. I think the 30-minute test is more about system stability, but nonetheless, we did the 30-minute test. So what did you score, Pete? So I scored 6,239. And how does that compare to what you scored on the 10 minute test? Well, there is a difference. It's uh, 6,595 on the uh, 10 minute test. So this has slowed down then doing the 30 minute test as opposed to the 10 minute. So the thermal throttling thing is, is affecting performance. Let's face it, that's still a pretty, pretty great score for a MacBook Air. Absolutely, yeah. So what about you? What score did you get? All the sevens, Pete, 7,777 points. And when I did the 10 minute test, it scored 7,753. So a slightly higher score, I mean, that doesn't, it, you know. It's, it's gonna really, vary, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a margin of error, that. So in other words, it makes no difference to, to the Mac Mini. And I would imagine you'd get the same result with the MacBook Pro as well, uh, because of that active cooling. Although I have to say, have you heard the fan spinning on this thing yet? No, I haven't. No. When it does uh, spin up, it is really quiet, and it doesn't actually seem to spin at a very high RPM, so it's not even getting that hot. Mm. But that little bit of extra cooling does make a difference, and that is you know that is quite a performance difference. And just to be clear, this is a CPU-only test, so yeah. there's no GPU action involved, so that uh, the MacBook Air having one less GPU core makes no difference to the Cinebench result. So this is purely down to the thermals of the system. If I was really good at math, Pete, I could work out on the spot what the percentage difference is, but I'm not, so I'll just add it in the edit. It will appear on 
somewhere here on screen. There we go. Whilst we're talking benchmarks, we've got our, our spreadsheet open. So we, we've started to compile a spreadsheet with lots of different Macs, but we're not going to share all of this with you yet. Uh, I know uh, a couple of you have asked about having some charts, and we did promise that, and we will do that. Um, but those will come once we've tested a few more Macs. You know, we're still only a couple of days really into our testing. So Geekbench 5, single core score, Pete, for the MacBook Air was 1,729. And I got on the Mac Mini 1,735. Again, I would say there's no difference. That's just a margin of error thing. And when you run these benchmark tests, you'll get different results every time. There'll be marginal differences. For single core performance, they're identical. And again, I, I'm, you know, we've explained this before, but single core performance is what you're gonna see with your day-to-day -day web browsing, content consumption, using Microsoft Office and those kind of tasks. Fast single core performance is what you want for all of that stuff. Uh, these are really fast. So for ev everyday work, fantastic. Definitely. Multi-core score, Pete? 7,454. Okay, and I got 7,583. So these are very close. And I suspect the difference is the additional eight gigabytes of RAM on this one. And I suspect that may be part of the difference in Cinebench as well, actually. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, it could well be. Could well be. We're going to have to get a MacBook Air with 16 gig of RAM to find out, really, aren't we? Well, I think Apple have had enough of our money. Uh, and uh, yeah, tune into this week's podcast for an amusing story about the Apple and the MacBook Air. Uh, so obviously, the Geekbench 5 multi-core score only takes less than two minutes to run. You're not getting into thermal issues. So what you're seeing here is the performance of the, the CPU. Uh, it's not far behind. I suspect that difference is due to the RAM. So... Uh, whichever one of these M1 Macs you're going to buy, you're going to get pretty much the same CPU performance for bursting. So if you need to have a quick burst of activity on your computer for whatever you're doing, all of them will be able to cope with that. Uh, and I suspect it's only that sustained load, you know, where the MacBook Air starts to show its limitations. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable conclusion. Uh, so let's talk about the graphics benchmark in Geekbench. We tested OpenCL, but these cards are optimized for Apple's Metal Framework. So um, I've got the paid for version of Geekbench 5 from the App Store because I do a lot of testing and that's a version behind the one that's on the website. So I suspect the, uh, the new version is still being waiting to be approved by Apple. Um, so I downloaded the free version so I could do the metal test because it doesn't exist in my version. And the Mac Mini scores 21,982. And the MacBook Air scores? Uh, 18,877. So that's the difference, presumably, that one GPU core makes, uh, but potentially also the, the RAM may factor into that as well. Might a little bit, yeah. yeah. Um, but we'd certainly expect it to be slower. It's got seven GPU cores instead of eight. Uh, now let's put these scores into context. So if you were to have bought the, the MacBook Pro 15 inch last year, yep. I know they released one with a Vega 20 card in, but before that, the top card was the Radeon Pro 560X. I'm pretty sure that is it. So that's I have, it. I have that laptop model. Um, and that, in fact, that's on our list here. That scores 18,867. So in other words, identical to this MacBook Air here. So in this $1,000 entry-level notebook, you're getting the same graphics performance, according to the benchmark, as a $3,000 plus dollar notebook just over a year ago. That's right. Uh, and I think that's, it's important to stress how amazing that is, you know, for integrated graphics as well, and no fans in the system. I mean, the, the fans on the 15 inch and indeed the 16 inch MacBook Pro like to ramp up, don't they? They do, they do. We're running out of superlatives, but it is phenomenal. It is good. Uh, however, what we have seen from our testing is the benchmarks don't tell the whole story. Uh, and in the real world, what you'll find, particularly with GPUs, because there's so many disciplines for a GPU to take care of, is that these things perform very, very well in some areas and not so well in other areas. I tried running GFX Bench on, on my Mac Mini, and I was uh, there's lots of different tests involved there. And for some of the tests, it outperforms things like the D700, which was the top of the range card in the 2013 Mac Pro. Wow. 
you know, things that would typically bench in the 40,000 region on Geekbench 5. And for some tasks, it's considerably quicker. But then for other tasks, it's considerably slower. So a benchmark is just an average of the performance and you need to do real world computing to really see what the performance is like. We've got that expression, your mileage may vary. Yeah. It's exactly the same, isn't it, when you get the miles per gallon on your car? Well, it depends on so many factors as to what you're actually going to get from a car uh, if it's got fuel in it as opposed to an yeah. EV. So we've done, uh, we've done some real work with these machines, with the, the video editing we mentioned earlier, but what about other real work? Well, it's fair to say we still haven't had these machines for very long, so we haven't had enough time to uh, really assess these on a day-to-day -day basis, so we're going to have some more videos coming up on that. Uh, but we, we've certainly tried out uh, the big hitters, Office 365. Yeah, I'd, you've probably worked a bit heavier in it than me, but I, you know, I've done, I've tried to do my daily work that I would normally do in Office 365, and any issues? No issues at all. But I, I wouldn't expect there to be any because, you know, it's not the most taxing application unless you're opening, as you showed in your video yesterday, you know, very large documents. But we've shown that these computers can handle that. So, uh, I think from that from that perspective, it's fine. Uh, haven't had time to do any more really heavyweight work. I mean, that video editing yesterday is the first time we've really sat down for a few hours and pushed the machines yeah. hard. Um, I'm very keen to look at what the performance is like in Logic. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to do a test against my Mac Pro, run a couple of benchmarks. Uh, I know some of you guys are looking forward to that. So uh, those videos will be coming, don't worry. Haven't you also tried uh, some of the Affinity programs? Oh, I have actually, yeah. Uh, Affinity Photo and Affinity Designer, I guess. Um, are they optimised for Apple Silicon yet? Yes, they are. Okay. Uh, yes, definitely optimised for Apple Silicon. Um, I loaded up a very large file uh, with lots of artboards in with effects and other things, and yeah, it's buttery smooth. I mean, we're talking something that really chokes on my quad-core i7 MacBook Pro 13-inch. Yeah, uh, even me, I, I've opened, uh, I haven't tried it on the MacBook Air yet, but um, I've opened Affinity d Designer boards on my MacBook Pro 16-inch, uh, and again, chug, chug city. What about Bluetooth connectivity? That's something someone specifically asked us about. Yeah, I've got to say, I haven't done a lot of testing yet. Um, I haven't plugged in headphones. Um, I've plugged in. Obviously, you don't plug in Bluetooth headphones. But um, I haven't used Bluetooth headphones yet, so I've not noticed any issues with that. Uh, so it's only the keyboard and trackpad that I've... But I haven't had any issues. But your, your experience has been a little different. Well, again, I've used a, an Apple keyboard and Magic Mouse. Um, and the Magic Mouse did have uh, intermittent drops of connection, but it's the same Magic Mouse I use with my MacBook Pro, and I get the same behavior there, so I suspect it's probably a fault with the mouse and not with the MacBook Air. What about printers? Because in your Mac Mini test, you obviously tried Secure Air Print at home, but again, someone asked us about proper business printers. Yeah, so um, I had no issue setting up the HP printers that I've got at home, but again, they support Air Print, so that's it's not a problem, but here we've got a big sort of Konica Minolta. Um, no doubt there'll be some B-roll now showing you our delightful biz hub. It's really exciting. Uh, so we wanted to try and install that. And uh, the process is that you go and download the driver from Konica Minolta, you install it on your computer, then you go to set up a network printer, and then you choose the model. So that's the setup process. Um, I went to download the driver. The most recent driver was from April and is for Catalina. Okay. So How did it go? Uh, well, first of all, just I think we have to say that's obviously not optimized for Apple Silicon. It's just a standard x86 driver for Catalina. So how did it go? Uh, it installs fine. Okay. There's no issue with it at all. So, Good stuff. I, I think that bodes really well. I, mean, I, wonder, I wonder whether we'll have the same compatibility with you know, plugins in Logic. Again, that's something I, I want to test. Yeah, and I've got a couple of plugins for Final Cut Pro that I will, will test as well. Um, you had a problem with uh, your USB-C monitor? Right, yeah, so um, with the Mac Mini, when you, if you're using the USB-C to drive a display output, uh, when you switch it on, it wasn't detecting my display, my Dell 4K display that I've got at home. Uh, so I've since uh, got this rather delightful portable monitor, uh, battery powered, it's actually running on battery at the moment. 
and uh, review will be coming to the channel on this particular screen at some point. Uh, this has a USB-C connection as well. I was keen to try a different brand and I can confirm that it works fine. Okay. So I'm guessing this is a Dell specific bug. I know from the comments, some of you guys have had the same issue with different models of Dell monitor. And I'm pretty sure someone said as well, they had the same issue with the 2018 Mac mini. So it may be a Dell thing. I, I don't know the answer to that. In any case, it's not a massive issue. You just unplug it and replug it and it will detect the monitor and work. I noticed yesterday when you were editing, you were having issues with your headphones on the MacBook Air. Yeah, so um, I've got some AKG three and a half inch. Wired, standard wired headphones. Standard hair. headphones, yeah, I use them for our podcasts. And um, every so often in Final Cut Pro, I was losing the audio. So you'd be editing away and suddenly you couldn't hear anything. You sort of, what's going on here? You, you check your settings. And uh, what I found is you had to unplug the headphone jack and then just plug it back in again. It's almost like the MacBook Air detected it again. Um, now, I say in the MacBook Air, I, what I didn't do at the time, I'm, go, I'm going to investigate this, is I didn't know if it was Final Cut Pro. I didn't see if other system sounds or other applications were still piping sound out. So whether it was a, a Final Cut Pro uh, specific issue or whether it was something on the system, I'll find out and report back on that. But it was frustrating. Yeah. And I think we, we also need to fess up as well to... to um, we showed some gaming on these things. Yeah, we uh, did. Just again, we've just got to say this. There's no intention to use these computers for gaming. We just thought it was an interesting test to show what they could do with, with Rosetta. And yesterday in your video, we had Farming Simulator running and we included it in the footage for the video, but... But we found out it does crash. So, so far I haven't actually been able to play it. It looked amazing, I was able to move around a little bit, but then it would crash. So if I've um, got anyone excited about the possibility of playing Farming Simulator on the MacBook Air with Apple Silicon, I'm really sorry, you might want to hold back if that's your primary reason for purchase. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody should be buying these computers to play games on. If you, if you want to play games for the same amount of money, you can get a, a decent gaming PC. Or maybe even one of the new Xbox or PlayStation consoles. Oh, yeah, they're really good. For, for half the money. Of course, some of those issues may be resolved for me with the Big Sur update that I've got to yet install for the MacBook Air, which I didn't do yesterday because you had a bit of an experience with that. Yeah, so these computers come with 11.0, and of course the latest version of Big Sur is 11.0.1. So I have updated mine to 11.0.1, uh, but it took a long time to do it. How long? Over an hour. Really? Yeah. And I don't know how long it should take. Maybe it should take that amount of time, but it was the progress bar telling me that I had five minutes to go and, you know, 20 minutes later, it's still telling me that. Uh, Maybe they've recruited an engineer from Microsoft to do the progress bars. <laughs> Could be. Although based on the Big Sur download progress bar debacle the other day, I, I, think, I think maybe Apple have got problems themselves. Yeah, maybe. Um, so I suggested to you it might be best not to install it because of time constraints, um, but you obviously will install that and then maybe report back and see if you have the same experience. Yeah, definitely. We both did have the slightly odd experience though. When you do the first reboot after setting up your new Apple Silicon Mac, for both of us, it booted into recovery mode. And I actually thought something was going wrong and I rebooted mine three or four times and every time it went into recovery mode. Uh, it, all it does is it asks you to type in the password for one of the accounts on there. As soon as you type in the password, it boots into Mac OS, and that's what it's done every time since. So, but we both had the same thing, so just be interested to see if anyone else out there is reporting that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll do some research and perhaps follow up on, on, on our podcast next week to see if it's being widely reported. You've done another test with Zoom? Yeah, I wanted to make sure I, I reported very favorably on a, a very long Zoom meeting. Uh, when I reviewed the MacBook Air in yesterday's video. And I thought I wanted to make sure that was not an anomaly. So I did another uh, two plus, maybe two and a half hour Zoom meeting. Again, full video. I also was air playing it to an Apple TV. Uh, and I lost about 5% of the battery in that time. 5%. That's amazing. It's stunning. My MacBook Pro 16 inch without being plugged in, which the MacBook Air wasn't, will manage about two hours. Uh, I, I wonder whether, um, I mean, it's obviously incredibly efficient. 
So I, I assume it must be offloading the, the video side of things to a custom chip that sits in the silicon, you know, I mean, because there is one for video encoding and decoding. Uh, and that is obviously an incredibly efficient process. Um, but, you know, I've, I've run Zoom on my iPad Pro and it definitely uses more percentages of battery. Might be a different size battery, I don't know. But uh, yeah, obviously very well optimized. How will it do though, Pete, with the battery destroyer of video conferencing systems that is Microsoft Teams? Well, someone I think in the comments did ask about that and quite rightly because Teams hates your battery. Um, and we are often lament when we're in meetings that you always have to be plugged in. So I'm intending to use this as my daily driver of which Teams is a big part of my, my daily workload for the next couple of weeks, as much as I can, and I will report back on that because I'd be very interested to see that. What I will say is the um, camera quality uh, was vastly improved on the MacBook Air over the MacBook Pro, which we were expecting because uh, the, the machine learning calls help, particularly with low light levels. Uh, so yeah, a really good, good camera experience. Obviously, it's never going to be as good as the camera you get in your phone or your iPad because optically, uh, you've only got a very small uh, piece of glass there compared to in the iPads and the iPhones, but it was it was perfectly good for conferencing and a much better experience than than previous machines. Uh, that is that is good to know. I mean, it's not a new camera, of course, so it is literally just doing better better processing of the image, better denoising. Um, yeah, which is good. I mean, you know, that's what people are going to use that kind of computer for. You know, I, I've obviously not been able to test any of this because uh, the Mac Mini has no. No camera, so uh, I'd be interested to, to see how you get on with that. I occasionally also have to sit in meetings. Uh, sometimes I have to sit in meetings with Pete, so uh, it's tough. It is tough. Um, it's made more difficult by the fact that my laptop battery will drain so fast when Teams is running. So if they, fi if they can fix that, that would be amazing. Do you know what I find tough about meetings with you? I knew you were waiting to say something. Go on. Well, you're always in good light conditions, so I can see your face in all its glory. Oh, that is hard on you. Too right. Uh, so just a couple of uh, questions that we've had from the comments section. So someone spoke about exhaust ports for the MacBook Air. And um, I actually haven't checked this. I, I don't think it has any. No. Which, we don't as, think it has any. as was commented, if that is the case, that's a good thing because mach machines with fans and, and ports, exhaust ports, suck in dust. That's it, yeah, so it's important to understand that if you're not, you know, sort of super techy or anything. If you've got a fan in a machine, it's obviously drawing in cool air through the computer and exhausting it out the back. Uh, and with that air, it draws in a whole bunch of dust as well, so... No dust ingress is going to be better for your machine, so, again, better component longevity because of that. Someone asked about Geekbench and Cinebench as to whether they're native um, Apple Silicon apps or whether they're going through Rosetta. They are both native Apple Silicon apps. Yeah, uh, Cinebench R23 is native for Apple Silicon and uh, Geekbench 5, the latest version. Uh, as I said, the, the one on the App Store isn't, doesn't have the metal test in yet unless it's been updated since two days ago. Uh, but the one you download off the website does. So, yeah, you can run all of these tests yourself on your own machines. Uh, share your results. We'd be interested to hear them. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so let's uh, let's sort of sum up our experience for, for this video anyway. Um, you know, we'll, we'll make some more videos once we've done more work on these machines and we'll, we'll sort of relate to you our real-world experiences. Uh, one of the things that we've not been doing in this video is just head-to-head -head tests of different things on these computers because I don't think we're going to see anything different to what we've already discovered. I think we already have the measure of the machines and really now it's down to specific workloads and how the M1 uh, applies to those. When it comes to the difference between the models, now there are lots of reviewers on YouTube saying, you know, what's the point in bothering with the MacBook Pro? All it offers you is a touch bar and a slightly brighter screen. Um, that's not true. Uh, you know, the people saying that the MacBook Pro doesn't actually offer anything for the Pro We've proven that's not true. Mm. Um, you know, if you're if you're a video editing professional, anyway, uh, you certainly don't want one of these MacBook Airs. I would say. No, I, I would I would concur with that. I think if you had maybe the 16 gigabyte version and you needed it as a backup machine, or if you're traveling, you could probably use it. Um, 
like I say, I want to try the ProRes 422 footage to see if that eliminates some of the issues and maybe a few updates might help. But yeah, I wouldn't rely on it as, a, as my dedicated editing machine. No, and I think for the fairly small price difference to step up to the, to the MacBook Pro and get the active cooling, uh, that would make more sense for me. We're talking about the application here for professionals. Um, and really, we probably would say that anybody who relies on their computer to make money should probably wait for the next generation of the M1. But there are still plenty of enthusiasts, there are students, you know, people who are learning their craft. These machines are perfectly capable of doing that. And I would say it's only video editing so far that we've seen that really taxes this. I can't see there being any problem running Photoshop, Illustrator, Lightroom on the MacBook Air. No. Because it still offers performance, even with the thermal throttling, it's offering performance at such a high level. Uh, it'd be perfectly usable for that. But I think if you're serious about video, then... You need to wait. And it's fair to say, you know, we have come across some bugs. Uh, they will probably get fixed. Anyone coming into a brand new, both operating system and architecture, expecting no bugs or throwing their hands up and saying, oh, typical Apple, there's bugs. Well, that's just a, a course for life. And if you're an early adopter, you need to be prepared for that. So I got a question for you. Okay, yeah. Daily drivers. So I'm gonna try this out for a few weeks. Okay, and as much as possible, use it as my daily driver. But you've been finding this pretty good for video editing compared to your desktop daily driver, which is the Mac Pro 2013. Would you consider swapping to making this your daily driver at this point? No, I wouldn't. Um, let me explain that. I, I'm excited about the M1 Mac Mini, and I, I think it's got a lot of performance. Um, for any single core task, it wipes the floor with the, with the Mac Pro, and it's going to, of course, that machine is seven years old. It's not designed for single core performance. It's designed for heavy lifting, and that's all I use it for. You know, my daily driver is a, is a MacBook Pro 13-inch. That's what I do my office work on. Uh, but it wouldn't be fair to make that comparison because it's a, a desktop machine. So I use my 2013 Mac Pro, which is a 12 core with 64 gigs of RAM. I've got an eGPU with it, and I use it pretty much exclusively for video editing in the full version of DaVinci Resolve. And I watched the, the M1 do its rendering yesterday, and I know what kind of frames per second performance I get from the Mac Pro, and I have to say, the M1 Mac Mini running the free version of Resolve that is not yet optimized for Apple Silicon was very close to the frame rate on rendering that my Mac Pro setup achieves. Wow. However, it was H.264 footage. The Mac Pro is not optimized for H.264 footage. So the frame rate I get when I'm rendering out from Blackmagic RAW, for example, if I've shot with the Blackmagic camera, uh, is much higher. And I happen to know that at the moment, the DaVinci and the M1 Mac Mini don't handle Blackmagic RAW very well. So when the new version of DaVinci comes out, I'll test it again and I'll reassess my, my judgment on that. But I sort of, I'm thinking that it'll probably be the next generation where I replace my Mac Pro. Yeah. And I, I've lingered on that. If you're not interested in the 2013 Mac Pro, then I apologize. But I know lots of my subscribers are interested in that machine. So they, they would be interested in my take on this. So very impressive. Uh, would I go out and buy a 2013 Mac Pro right now in view of what's happening with the M1? That's a good question, would you? No, I'm afraid I wouldn't. Mm. Um, so same question to you, really, Pete. Does this excite you to the point where suddenly you're thinking, I want to use this as my daily driver? If we take size out of the equation, because I know you like a, a bigger one. <laughs> I, I do like a bigger one. And also the, the ports do make a difference as well. You know, my MacBook Pro has got four ports, that does make a difference. I often have them all utilized. But putting those things aside, um, and putting aside the video editing issues that we've reported, for my day-to-day -day office tasks, yeah, I would, I would consider this as a daily driver, and we'll see. I'll, I'll come to a conclusion in a couple of weeks having, having done such. Mm. I, yeah, I don't think that's a surprise. I think for most day-to-day -day general purpose computing, this is the fastest computer the best value for money, the best battery life. It's the best of everything. Um, so when you hear the YouTubers and other reviewers waxing lyrical about this, it's for good reason. 
And I think it's only really when you get up to the very heavy workloads and the edge cases of real world, you know, difficult computing tasks that where they start to show some limitations. Yeah. Um, but we need something left in the tank for the for the next generations. We do, and you know, we've said this before, but it it bodes well. It really does. Uh, my last comment on the, the two ports as well, it's not just having the lack of ports, it's having them both on the left-hand side of the computer. Uh, for me, I know with my MacBook Pro, I use both sides to charge, depending on where I'm sat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Same here. Uh, so obviously that's incredibly convenient, and it's not so convenient with these particular ones. And I suspect that will definitely be something that changes with the next generation. You know, I, I think there will be a four port version. Yeah, absolutely. So I hope you found that useful as a sort of comparison between the machines based on the, the limited time that we've had them and the work that we've been able to do. Uh, we're not stopping here, as we keep saying, you know, we're gonna keep on testing, we'll, we'll keep making videos. We've got some very specific things, we'll do some showdown tests, um, particularly with other computers as well, other Apple machines. So again, anything that you want to see or any questions you've got, please leave those in the comments section. We'll try and cover off as many as we can. Just want to say thanks again to Wondershare PDF Element for sponsoring this episode. Really do appreciate it, guys. And don't forget to check out the links in the description for that special offer. As always, we hope you enjoyed the content. Uh, maybe we did enough to earn a thumbs up or a thumbs down if that's your thing. In any case, see you next time for some more geekery.